happening. So what what is that like first place of combat look like? What does that first battle look like? Well, we um, we went out on the trails and we were running three company operation. And we were looking for something and something big. And uh, we uh, were out in an area where there were ridge lines and hills popping up uh, in this valley. And um, we walked, we, we, we came by what it was obviously a field hospital, the North Vietnamese. There were bloody bandages there. The field hospital was abandoned. And I remember walking by it and thinking, oh, wow. Uh, somebody was here pretty recently. And you, when you're in a company of over 100 guys, you feel some security. And you've got another 100 right next to you and another 100 or so behind you a little ways as a reserve unit. And so we walked along and we started up this hill. And the, the trail was a well-developed trail. We weren't breaking brush. Um, and as we walked along, guys pointed out, oh, look, man, there's comma wire laying out. They're not even trying to cover it up. It was as though they wanted us to know that they were there on the top of the hill. And um, uh, there were steps that were dug in to the trail and reinforced with uh, large br uh, branches cut, shoved into the earth to hold it. And uh, all the signs were there that there were people there. And uh, we were, yeah, out in no man's land, but there were people here and probably on this hill. And we kept moving up it. And we had a recon squad that went out. And they came down as we were coming up the hill. And they told the guys in front of us on point to be real careful. There's something up there, be real careful. And that's all we knew. And we continued up two phalanx, my company, Delta Company, and Charlie Company, and Alpha behind us. And we sort of came to a little bit of a clearing, and the lead platoon moved up on both sides. And then they just opened up on us with everything. You know, they just unleashed hell on us. And guys were getting hit. I saw a guy get hit with a B-40 rocket, and he just disappeared. And I mean, I just wasn't ready for this. I mean, who is? And guys were getting hit everywhere, yelling, screaming. And the sky was just filled with green tracers. Our tracers were red. Theirs were green. So when you see all these green tracers coming at you, be afraid and get your head down. At first, I was just stunned. I couldn't move. It's though I had 200 pound sandbags on both legs. I didn't know whether to go forwards or backwards. It was just screaming, yelling, and just complete cacophony. It's just so much noise. You can't believe how much noise it is. And all of a sudden, somebody came up behind me, get down, get down, and it hit me like that. And I got down. And other guys were just falling, didn't know what to do. And then, you know, the word was, move up, move up, move up. And we started moving up, and more guys hit, hit, boom, boom, everywhere. And then somebody, thank merciful Jesus, said, fall back, fall back, fall back. And we started falling back. And I remember we were told to drop our rucksacks. And we dropped our rucksacks. And we tried to go forward again. And then we fell back leaving our rucksacks with a lot of our ammunition, our water, and uh, there just wasn't time to get it. I was helping a guy down the hill who was wounded, and it just, you know, so much going on. And we fell back and we formed a perimeter uh, with my company, Delta Company, Charlie Company, and then Alpha Company, which was behind us. 
uh, was trying to come up to reinforce us. They were our reserve company. Well, the North Vietnamese were very clever. They knew how we operated as an airborne infantry unit. They knew that we would have, in a battalion size operation, we'd have two companies forward and one in the rear. And they wanted to take out the whole battalion. I mean, the 173rd Airborne was a premier military unit and the first Army full combat unit into Vietnam in May of 65. And they wanted us, all of us. So they let my company and Charlie Company go through on the trail. And they were down at the bottom of the trail, a bunch of them. Probably they figured later we heard a couple hundred. And they let then our two companies go through. And then when Alpha Company started to come in, that's when they hit them. They wanted to envelop them and take out our uh, reserve. And um, one, two guys, three guys actually, as I understood it, stayed behind. And um, uh, two of the three were wounded and, and left and went back up and joined Alpha Company as they were moving up the hill. And one guy stayed behind with an M60 machine gun, which is what I carry, the M60, the 23-pound gun. And his name was Carlos Lozada. And uh, Carlos stayed behind, fought off the NVA. They figured that he probably killed two dozen North Vietnamese on the trail as he just took a position, stayed there until they killed him. And uh, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Incredible. Had he not done that, Alpha Company probably wouldn't have gotten up to us and so we could form a rear and, and a secure perimeter, fairly secure. And so that was the start of that first day. And as the afternoon went on, uh, we had endless airstrikes coming from the South China Sea uh, from the east to the west, coming over the top of the hill and dropping bombs and artillery, just endless artillery, bombs from aircraft. And then a uh, Marine Sky Raider, which is kind of a low flying, uh, like the, uh, the A1C Warthog or whatever they call it they had in the Gulf War, kind of slow like that, but heavy ordnance. Rather than flying from uh, the east to the west over the top of the hill, he came up the hill, up the ridge line, like we did. And he misjudged where he was, I think, and others. And he, he thought he saw something on the ground, a flash, which made him think it was the enemy. And so he released two 500-pound bombs, and it was right on top of us. And one bomb landed in a tree and stuck in the tree and didn't go off. The other one landed right in the, mid in the middle of our battalion CP and took out one of two company commanders there. Alpha Company's commander had already been killed, been shot and killed. And we had all the wounded and as many of the dead that we could pull in in the middle of this uh, CP. And our battalion chaplain, Father Waters, and the bomb landed right there. Took out almost all the medics. I think it killed 11 of 13 medics. And uh, the bomb killed something like 42, 43 guys and wounded another 45 or something, close to 90. Uh, it was the largest friendly fire incident of the Vietnam War. And um, that was late in the afternoon. We were all just stunned. I mean, I didn't know what to make of it. And uh, um, I just took my place on the perimeter and uh, did, you know, looked out in front. And there was kind of a lull for a while, and then they hit us uh, after dark. And, you know, you could hear them assembling because they were using bugles and whistles to assemble in the dark and then to rush our perimeter. And so we fought them. How long, I, I don't remember. But it went on for a while. 
and then they stopped. And I don't, don't know what time it was, but you know, it had gone on. Um, the bombing and the artillery went on all night, and uh, I thought for sure that they'd hit us at dawn, you know, before the dawn, and uh, that'd be it. I mean, we were really low on ammunition. There was little to no water. Father Waters had been blown in half. And Father Waters had spent the whole day going up and down the hill, grabbing wounded, pulling them back, and uh, as well as trying to get ammunition and water for us. He was just an incredible man. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. And uh, so, surprisingly, they didn't hit us the next morning. I've never understood that. And uh, I mean, they, they had us. They could have, you know, run right over us. Um, we began to realize what we were up against. Um, didn't know how many, but they figured that it was a reinforced regiment of North Vietnamese. Uh, we were the 173rd Airborne. Our, later, we found out this was the 174th North Vietnamese Regiment, NVA. And um, uh, we tried to assault their bunkers. We didn't realize that the whole top of the hill had this huge bunker complex on it. On, on top of the hill, the, there were individual bunkers and then inner bunkers and a command post. And all the bunkers were interconnected with trenches and covered a uh, triple layer of wood and dirt on the top of every bunker. So 105 rounds just bounced off the top, literally. Uh, it took some, took, you know, some force to penetrate the, the, the bunkers that they'd built. And fully camouflaged, you couldn't see them. So um, uh, the next day, we pretty well stayed inside the battalion, inside the perimeter. And that night, uh, one of our battalions found us, uh, the 4th Battalion came in, and it was after dark. And I remember um, their lead platoon, um, they were asked, how did you find us? It was at night. And the platoon leader in the lead platoon said, we just followed the dead up the trail. And this was 300 new men. And we'd lost maybe about half our battalion dead and wounded, out of a little 330, I think there were, and we'd lost easily half. And uh, so, um, fourth battalion was there. They they had water and <laughs> ammunition, and we didn't have much. And uh, so, that was the night of the second day. Third day, we stayed within the perimeter. Helicopters tried to come in drop off supplies to us. The Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, were monitoring our radios and uh, they would hear, you know, we were told to pop smoke, purple smoke. And they'd do the same thing, but off over, away from our perimeter. And things were being kicked out to them and they tried to uh, get medevacs in, dust offs, and dust offs were shot down. Uh, it was, we, we were isolated completely isolated, and uh, we had reinforcements, but we were, you know, pretty well isolated. And um, so the um, third day went by, then the fourth day, we tried to take the hill again. And this time, the fourth battalion went up first. They took, they took the point, and they said, you know, you guys in second bat, you can stay here. You don't have to come up with us. And we said, <laughs> we're going. And we fell in. And we didn't get very far. No farther than, maybe not even as far as we did the first day. And they just cut the 4th Battalion apart. Guys dead and wounded everywhere. And so we just pulled back down inside the perimeter again. And that was day four. Then day five um, went up the hill again. And this time we took the hill. We were able to get up there. And uh, we didn't realize it, but the night before the North Vietnamese had gone off the backside of the hill, most of them, 
that were left and went to Cambodia, crossed over into Cambodia. And uh, they left the dead and some wounded and a blocking force behind. And, uh, you know, there were dead North Vietnamese all over the top of the hill. And they brought us out, I don't know, it was past midday, I don't know, early afternoon. Uh, they came out with food, hot, hot chow. And none of us had really eaten much in five days. And uh, I remember standing in the line and walking over and they opened up these Miramite cans, these, these green cans, and they had uh, turkey and all the fixings. And then I realized, and we all realized, it's Thanksgiving. 67, it's Thursday. We started up the hill on Sunday, and today is Thursday. Wow. And uh, so there I was. I'd been in Vietnam three weeks, and uh, this was the opening act. Um, a few months later, it was the Tet Offensive, 68, and the whole country was on fire. Um, they had laid in troops everywhere, and uh, it was just a hell of a fight. We uh, went out and defended a Green Beret A camp and pushed the North Vietnamese out of the wire of a, North, of a uh, Green Beret A camp on the Cambodian border. And um, by then, here now, February of 68, and then I remember uh, being told that Walter Cronkite had come over to Vietnam to personally inspect how the boys were doing here during this Tet Offensive, uh, which we all find out later was the largest military engagement that U.S. forces had fought since the Battle of the Bulge towards the end of the Second World War. And uh, so it was, it was huge. And um, uh, Walter Cronkite told the American people that the war could not be won. And Lyndon Johnson said you would not run for president. Walter Cronkite tells the American people that the war cannot be won. I'm not running as president. So Lyndon abandoned us. And then April came around. Martin Luther King, Dr. King, was assassinated. Two months later, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And then in July, the riots in Chicago. And it was just crazy time. And then for those of us in the field, all kinds of stuff. 